Wise and courageous leader, the shadows of conflict are fast approaching. Now is the time to prepare, as it will be too late to sharpen your sword when the battle is upon you. Copper ore can be smelted into fine blades by weaponsmiths. An administrative city will be necessary to oversee the military and revenue collection. Arm and train a stalwart troop of soldiers to protect the city and its people. To partially offset the cost of raising this force, taxes should be levied. Loggers can provide wooden ledgers needed by the tax collectors for their record keeping. Now might be the perfect time for generous offerings to the great hero Huang Di. Perhaps the wisdom and might of the fabled Yellow Emperor will aid your city in its time of need. Our journey in Early Tao continues with Men of Arms. We need to get 1,500 for our population, growing even more, and produce 20 racks of weapons. We've got metallurgy going on. We've got logging. We've got the trappings of government. So definitely some key advances for our society. Now we are, of course, looking at Early Tao just as we left it, except for one thing, the cash here. And I wish that they had had a little bit lower on the treasury for this particular scenario, a little bit more on the previous one. It probably would have been better balanced. But I think they were trying to ensure that you'd be okay if you came into this scenario and weren't making a bunch of money. I mean, you should be by the end of the first one, but not guaranteed. I do want to correct one thing here. We've got rice coming into this warehouse. Plenty of room for that at the mill and elsewhere. And then we need to bring in some more people. We're going to need to hit that 1500 mark, both to hit the population goal and to get the labor force that we're going to need for some of the other activities. And I'm going to definitely want to boost my wage rate for a bit. We're going to have the money for it now. And I also am going to need a lot more food. So I'm going to deal with that food situation first. Let's go ahead and... We're going to move the hemp farm. We're not going to get rid of it completely, we're just going to move it. Because I want to create room for some more wheat down in this area. It'll be more optimal if I slide this over just a bit. There we go. High unemployment will not be a problem for long, I assure you. Now, if I throw a farmhouse over here to handle the wheat aspect, that'll be good. And we should immediately be able to afford that with the higher wages. We should be able to afford another fishing quay down here. And of course, we can import all the rice that we need, but just the one wheat farm and the two fishing quay is not going to be quite enough to support 1,500 people. And then I also can put up one more thing that we're going to need, which is under raw materials industry, we're going to put up a logging shed right down here. And additionally, we'll put out an inspector's tower. So what they're going to do is they're going to go around and look for any nearby trees, and I think there's a range amount that they can go out, but it's quite extensive, if not infinite. Because they'll just go around, try to find the nearest trees, chop them down. We'll see them in a bit. But we need to get some housing going. Whoops, I do not want that. There we go. Let's try this again. So I want to leave that last spot open for something else. And then, yeah, you say you have too many workers. We really don't. That will be changing. So over here, we could not put no more housing because it would be inauspicious feng shui. But over here, we can fit another one. And then we're going to throw down some walls. Might as well do that. We have the money for it. I want to fill in with some gardens. Just to make sure everything is feeling wonderful and highly desirable for the people to live. Okay, and then let's also plop down our wheat fields. And fill in the rest of our hemp. So you can see that there's a bit of the hemp area. 
and more of the wheat area that's cut off by trees. But we'll still get more than what we need out of it. Just gonna plop another access road over here. And yeah, we need a few more workers to run all of this, but we'll be good very soon as these people come in and make their presence felt in the city. So while they're all doing that, we can see our loggers going away, chopping away, getting this wood. This wood is going to be needed for the tax collection activities so they can mark down who's paid what and who still needs to pay and what exactly everybody's obligation is, etc. Let's take a look at our third ancestral hero. That would be Huang Di, who is angry with us, and we're going to want to make him happy. We're not going to focus on Nu Wa here. But let's go ahead and throw some ceramics at him right away. And that will help some, and we'll be throwing more at him as this scenario continues. So, the Yellow Emperor. Huang Di is one of the legendary Chinese emperors, a great military leader, our first military character. He and his wife are credited with many inventions. We talked about the Empress Lei Zhu and silkworms in the previous scenario. When active, Huang Di halves the building cost of a whole bunch of stuff, satisfies any ceramics requests from other cities, functions as diviner and acupuncturist walker. And we can't even do acupuncturist yet, so that's a nice little bonus can bless kilns or silkworm sheds, add ceramics to a house every time he walks past it. So that's pretty cool. Save us on some of our ceramics. In addition, helps the morale of chariot companies. We won't be able to do those yet. And can fight enemies both at home and abroad. So definitely someone who impacts both domestically and in matters of conflict. And it's worth, I think, taking a bit of a deeper dive into the history here of Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor. According to tradition, all of the Chinese people descended from Huang Di. He's a common ancestor for all of them. It is said that he ruled from about 2700 to 2600 BCE, came to power as a child, and lived to be about 115. As was mentioned, responsible for many inventions, traditionally. Law and government and the wheel and writing and music, etc. And late in his life, spent a number of years attempting to attain spiritual perfection, and is still very much a highly honored figure in Chinese society, particularly within the Taoist tradition. Now, at least some of that is, you know, potentially possible, but then there is also the mythological element. Among the more fantastical elements attributed to him are things like having four faces, you know, one facing in each of the direction of the compass, able to keep his eye on the realm at any given moment, nothing would escape his notice. Ascending into the sky on a dragon at the end of his life in midday in full view of the populace, going about the countryside in a dragon-drawn chariot attended by tigers and wolves and flocks of the phoenix, etc. So you have both the mythological and the at least potentially historical elements. There could, of course, have been a person of great significance who did unite the tribes of the Yellow River area, and played a major role in prehistoric China. And perhaps some of the mythological elements got grafted on after that, or it could be the reverse, which is probably more likely, that Huang Di was originally a mythological construction, and then later on more practical, you know, human attributes and accomplishments were added to that. But regardless of where the truth is in that, and of course, when you're looking this far prehistorically, it's impossible to really know. Huang Di is definitely going to be very important to this scenario, and so we're going to be doing everything we can to keep him happy with us. So we need to get more labor in. We've got 18 now, actually. That's not bad, but our next step is to go into government as we begin to have these housing fill out and we're going to need an administrative city and we need 40 people for that so we're not quite there yet it is quite expensive and it is I think the single building which requires the most people 
But also, without the administrative city, you do not collect taxes, you do not build a military, so it is a very essential bit of infrastructure for us to get up. We're going to throw it right down here, eventually. There we go. And we've got all of our guards here and everything. Bulging with fat bureaucrats. Excellent. And that pretty much took us down to nothing. Now we need to get the tax office done, which is our other currently available item under government. And we're going to throw one of them here, which is why I left that spot open. And one of them up here. And they will, of course, need the wood. Now I should be adjusting this to allow some more items in. We're definitely going to want weapons. Bronzeware not available yet. Um, let's accept wood. And I, I think that'll do it for now. Bronze, just in case. And nobody's doing anything here because they don't have any wood yet. The loggers are, however, working away, and so it won't be too long before we get that. More people continuing to come in. And so you can see, like, there isn't a predefined area for them. They're just, they're moving off over into this way. And these trees will gradually regrow. They're not going to be eliminated permanently. So it's just a matter of how far they have to range. And it's just best, of course, to put the logging shed in an area where there are trees around. Now we're getting quite a bit of unemployment here, which means it's time for us to move on to our next objective, which is dealing with the whole bronze aspect. So I need to connect up some roads here first. I want to just throw these up. Not quite that far. I'm going to want to throw up some more roadblocks here. And then over this way, I want a bronze smelter as our first step. And these are a bit, uh, well, we'll see in a bit, but they're a little bit surrealistic. We're going to block off here. We're definitely going to need an inspector's tower here. We also will be needing one down here, so I'll just go ahead and throw that in place. And yeah, I, I like the way all of that is. But, I mean, even if we keep in mind that this is not supposed to be just our initial, you know, coming out of the Stone Age bronze smelter, this is going to be a structure that's used for that purpose for thousands of years, so it's supposed to represent the whole area. But still, it's, you know, it's definitely a large building. You've got 19 employees. It's going to be much more, you know, imposing than most things that we're going to build in the game. I'm going to throw up a couple more of these. We'll have a total of six of these, and then three weapons, or three of them, and six weaponsmiths. I got that backwards. But they need to go and grab the bronze, and then as it activates, you can see, like, you've got the little nuggets or whatever of bronze sliding down this thing. You know, it's like a three or four story high building. They're, they're pulling them out. You can see the activity here. They're blowing the air into the chamber. So there's some interesting elements. They got this sort of circular staircase going around it. So this has the impression to me of being about 20 degrees away from normal. It looks cool, but yeah, I don't th think this is exactly a representation of the structure that would have been used. So definitely some liberties being taken there. And we definitely need to use up some of this labor now for... I'm in the wrong thing. I need to be in military for the weaponsmiths. Let's get a whole bunch of these up. I'm just going to put them all up. Four there. Two more here. And it's not an exact ratio, but roughly these three bronze smelters should keep most of these weaponsmiths busy. So we are now down to 15... Okay, we need 20 people for our fort, which is the whole goal of this. So, we should be sufficiently ready to put one up. I'm going to throw it up over here, and these don't need inspectors. I'm going to clear this little bit so we can get a road heading out that way. But we've got bronze going to the weaponsmiths. They're going to turn those into weapons, which will then be sent off to the forts, and then they will train our military. 
And we're going to put another fort up. And I like the idea of putting them at different places around the city so that you at least have the ability to respond to things happening in different areas. And that should be close enough on our labor. So we're going to throw the other one all the way down here. And then now at this point, we're just kind of uh, not very many more. We'll be okay. Yeah, we're short three. We'll be fine. You can see we've used up quite a bit of our cash, but I don't need to really use up any more. And we still have a very healthy supply of these smelters going away. They're all active now. We've got most of our weaponsmiths active already, so it won't be long until we get some weapons out of this. And then can move on. Yeah, that one's 71% complete, so... Then they will begin to deliver them. And look at our fort. It needs resources before it can train any soldiers. Population-wise, we are good. But we're definitely going to have to wait at least another year because we need to produce 20 racks of weapon in a year. And there's no way we're hitting that before the end of this year. And there we go. They're going to haul our weapons away. Looks like one is trying to go to each of the forts. And they already actually got one over here. So now you can see the soldiers sparring. And they'll do that for a while, and then we will get a actual fully trained soldier available. You see they've got one stored, so we're going to begin building up a surplus. We didn't really need this many. We could have gotten away with, present, for example, uh, two bronze smelters and four weapon smiths, but I want to make sure that we have plenty going on. Sure, let's hold a festival. Why not? You can see our food supply doing pretty good. Our fish is not great, but there's enough. Food shop looking fine. Sizzling rice soup on the menu as of late. And also, if you notice now the names of these, they're the Audacious Snakes here. Bold Morale, Conscript Experience. We've got two infantry, and then we can send them wherever. Of course, the numbers will increase when they are needed. And these down here are the Battling Snakes. We have the Audacious and Battling Snakes. And of course they're named Snakes because I chose the snake as my Zodiac animal. It could be named anything, but that's what they're going to be called here. And from this point on, for the balance of you know 1875 BCE, there's really just going to be a lot of waiting going on. So I will skip through a bunch of that, but I also wanted to talk some more about Jade, which I think is really fascinating and something that at least for myself, having been brought up in Western culture, etc., uh, my cultural bias definitely showing in things that I did not know. So hopefully some of this will be of interest to all of you as well. The term Jade can refer to either of two different minerals, Jadeite and Nephrite. Green is the color most commonly associated with jadeite, also known as imperial jade, but it actually can be a wide range of colors, such as this lavender example. And emerald green, highly translucent jade is typically valued the highest. For purposes of perspective, high quality jade in recent years is commonly valued as high as gold or diamond. In the modern world, nearly three quarters of the world's supply of high quality jadeite is extracted from Myanmar, where it is expected it takes up over half of the GDP. Historically in China, it is white nephrite jade which is the most prominent, and in fact white jade is still the most in demand there. But nephrite can be found in other colors as well. A distinctive property of nephrite jade is that when it is struck, it rings or resonates musically. It is said that in the ancient imperial courts of China, specially constructed wind chimes were made out of jade. There is a fundamental geological reason why jade became more prevalent in some parts of the world than others. And that's simply that it only forms in seismologically active areas. That is, areas where there's a subduction zone, where one tectonic plate slides under another. And so jade deposits are mostly concentrated in what's known as the Ring of Fire around the Pacific Ocean. It became quite valuable in Central America. When the Spaniards came over and invaded, they were surprised that the Aztecs valued gold much lower than they valued jade. 
It's the National Stone of Japan, the Maori Civilization in New Zealand valued it quite highly. More recently, large deposits have been found in Western Canada, but the emerging civilizations in Egypt, Mesopotamia, etc. would not have had access to it. And there were more reasons to value jade than it simply being visually appealing. It has a very similar hardness to steel, making it extremely valuable for ancient tools and weapons. It also has a smooth texture, pleasant to hold and to feel. Although it's a couple thousand years further than we currently are in the timeline, jade probably reached its apex in use in China early 3rd century in the Han Dynasty. It was considered to have a number of virtues, benevolence based on the brilliance of the appearance, honesty due to the translucency and allowing light to penetrate, bravery and or integrity based on the fact that it could not be twisted, only broken. Probably the most extravagant single example is the use of jade burial suits at that time. These took years to construct. They were comprised of over 2,000 jade sections each, tied together with over 2 meters of gold wire. And certainly there are clear representation that in ancient China, they don't take a backseat to other ancient cultures in terms of having extravagant burial rituals for the rulers. There was even a medicinal, cultish sort of belief that sprang up. The idea that if you ground jade into very fine powder and mixed it with water and drank that, that it would contribute to your longevity. Or drinking from a jade cup even, again, would contribute to your long life, health, nobility, etc. So when you combine all the aspects being artistically valuable, being practically valuable, there's a pretty compelling case to be made that jade is the most impressive gemstone that humans have discovered. And it's easy to see why a culture like China that began to use it in Neolithic era, would come to prize it very highly indeed. There's an old Chinese saying that gold has its price, but jade is priceless. Confucius wrote glowingly about it. So jade is not merely some bauble or some elaborate trade good that was put into the game. It is something that was incorporated into every aspect of culture and society. Back in early Tao then, where we have some more tasks to perform, and we have had a few things worth noting over the last several months. First up, Bon Po demanded hemp and didn't do it very nicely. I am the all-powerful Ho Ji, and I could just come into your city and take them if I wanted to, so you might as well send them. We sent them the two bales of hemp, even though I'm not at all threatened by Bon Po at this point. And they were very happy about it. And then we discovered Ping Yang and went to go ahead and train a spy to get more information on them, but... Shortly afterwards, they decide to launch an invasion, so this is our endgame bit for this scenario and a test for our military buildup. Make sure you are prepared. In six months, they will show up. Chai Shen, the god of wealth, truly favors this prosperous city. Now, there's something else that the tax collectors do like to say. You all know it's better to give than to receive, especially to me. Uh, I mean, to your government. Yeah, that's the cynical bit. Now, Pingyang itself is basically just across the Yellow River from us. So we're not too far away from them. But apparently they're not content with what they have. Now, if we look at our government report here, as we are waiting for things to transpire, you can see we are making a good, good profit. Taxes in are more than our wages, so we're making a profit on that by itself. Profit on our exports is shown overall down here, and we're actually making more than that, but we spent a bunch on homage offerings. Now, Huangdi is high enough to come in, but it's sort of on the fence, so let's give him some more encouragement. I'm just going to throw a bunch of wheat his way at the moment. If that doesn't work, I'll throw more ceramics at him. I'm going to keep throwing homage offerings until he actually decides to show up. And we also have our military report. And here we go. They're launching an invasion. Hungry for more land to call their own. They will invade in five months. And we can see we have enemies approaching the city. We're told here on the military report. 20 soldiers in our two companies. And we can you know, focus in on those if we want there. And more be being trained all the time. We are looking good on our wood here. Look at our tax offices. They have plenty stored. So no problems there. And we actually have somewhat of a surplus of wood. We 
don't have any stored over here, but we will eventually. Still haven't heard anything from the Yellow Emperor, so... Oh, it hasn't been long enough. Alright. At this point, we're just... Just hanging out. And I could do some more finagling with the economy. Ah, there's Huang Di. There we go. And his acupuncturist ability now boosting these housing right away to an ornate apartments. That won't last long, though. No, no, I want to talk to Huang Di. And I'm not being successful in doing so. After my study with the great healer, Shi Bo, I can use fine needle to penetrate the channels of the body and harmonize the blood. So, talking about acupuncturism there, he has another line that we may hear eventually, referring to Lezu, silkworm production, etc. Let's go ahead and maybe give away some more stuff to Shen Nong. Although, we're not, we don't have that much of a surplus of anything else, so we'll just sort of hang on here, I think. But I could, talking about the economy, I could put up like another weaver to use some of the, I do have a bit of excess silk. And knock out, you know, some of our labor from agriculture during the non-growing season. But I really have no need to do that. So, we're just going to hang out and uh, wait, pretty much. We are now approaching the new year. See, we've got some wood now in the warehouse. Commendable generalship. Those three-headed dogs from Pingyang were certainly no match for your well-drilled infantry. The Sha Dynasty and these tutorials is now at an end. The winds of change are blowing, and a new people called the Shang are on the rise. So clearly we weren't quite intended to do this this quickly. See, we got 26 compared to 20. We really couldn't have skimped much more on the weaponsmiths and still got all the ones we wanted but you know they say they were no match for our welded infantry they haven't actually showed up yet congratulations you have successfully completed all of the Xia dynasty tutorial missions as the time of the Xia comes to a close however an exciting new chapter of Chinese history is about to begin in the lands of a people that call themselves the Shang a powerful new force is sweeping over the land. Now, since this is the final chapter, the final scenario in the Sha Dynasty, we do have the option to continue building. So we're going to do that. But looking forward to doing the Shang, that's actually the first dynasty where we have pretty good historical evidence for them. We've already won this mission, have chosen to continue governing this city, and the invasion will still occur. We've just got to wait a couple months for them to show up. And Huang Di is only joyful. So we need to fix that problem. His mood has begun to sour. Throw some more ceramics at him. Want to make sure that he sticks around. I find it easy to lose track of him. Got one month bent on conquest. They're coming in. So I just like to use this panel to, you know, focus in on Huang Di whenever needed. But to actually move them around, you use the banners, both here, as we'll see in a bit, for the forts. You can center it on the forts, of course, from the military screen. They are here, we're almost to 10,000 cash. Let's get this done. So we can surrender, we can bribe the army who wants to destroy the city, or we can fight. Definitely gonna fight. And they're gonna come in up this way. All right. So, 
we select our troops here at the fort. We just need to get them to the right location. Perfect morale. They are conscripts. We're going to move them over here. And these battling snakes, 14 of them. You can come up here as sort of backup. Then let's find Huang Di again. More specifically, find the banner. There we go. Let's have you come up here. Some of them may get past us, so if they do, let's have Huang Di take care of business. So, here they come. This is the attacking army. There's not that many of them. And our troops are headed that way. We're going to try to intercept them, and it looks like we actually got them all. Now, you are all coming over this way, but not really doing that much. The battle continues, appears to be going our way. And here's Huang Di. Yep, he's sh Okay, one of them coming down this way, and Huang Di is shooting arrows at them. And got him, and I think that was the last. Weakling soldiers are in full retreat, led by their embarrassed ruler, Huan Song Zhang. Your city is safe. You can see we pretty much knocked him out. Rest of our soldiers coming up here. And. You can see it's clear, like, I don't even think we lost anybody. If we lost any, it would be a very small amount. Everybody is happy. We are fully victorious. And that is it for Early Tao and the Shah. So we'll be heading off to the Shang Dynasty the next time we're in Emperor. But before that, we need to head back west to Egypt and see what's going on there. So until then, thanks for watching. See you soon.